a freezing night in December and a host of well-known faces from the sporting world and beyond gather to pay tribute to an all-time Celtic great. Despite thick fog and travel delays, Alec Ferguson and his Manchester United side finally arrived to provide the opposition for Paul McStay's testimonial match. It was a very special night for the Celtic captain, marking his 14th year as a first-team player. As the teams prepared for the game, there was time for some of those who have played with the maestro to reflect on his career. Because I've carried Paul and I've made him a millionaire and then I can't go out and do the business on the park like, you know what I mean? So, it's a bit unfortunate, you know? <laughs> I've made him a millionaire. Cut, 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 so the first time we'll really be caught out in his life, yeah, you know what I mean? Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and then that'll be arrested. Thanks, Paul. And Brian Neal's back, so I'm delighted I'm not fit. <laughs> I think the supporters are very keen. I think they've shown that the numbers have turned up. They buy tickets. Some of them have good for hours out there. So a real Celtic occasion, and uh, it's one I'm sure the whole mixed day family, particularly Paul, I look forward to very, very much. What's it like to I play alongside a Celtic legend like Andy Walker? Uh, some against. player, isn't it? Definitely. I just hope you run fast and score goals. Run fast and run fast, score yeah. goals. That's goal, the pressure on regardless. Yeah. A capacity crowd greeted Paul as he took the part with daughter Siobhan and Melissa for one of the most memorable occasions of a distinguished career. A very emotional time. And I think what hit me most the night of the game against Manchester was the feeling that well, maybe these fans were here to support Paul McStay on the night. Because all right through my career, it's been the team, the team, the team, and that's the way it should be. But for that one night, a special night, uh, as I said, it was, it was quite emotional, tell you that. Paul's Parkhead career began at an early age. While still at school, he already trained at Celtic Park, and the Celtic manager of the time had no doubt about where his future lay. I spoke to his teachers and, and they said, look, Paul's not really an academic, you know, he says, so we hope he makes it in football. I said, well, I think he's a certainty. So we got him released from school about six months early, basically on a, a work experience situation. So in actual fact, Paul was, was at Celtic Park, maybe learning the the first stages of his apprenticeship, uh, where he's still have been at school. The young McStay stood out among a rake of talented youngsters, which included his elder brother, Willie. When he came in, I was established in the youth team and then established in the reserves as Paul was coming on full time. And I honestly can't remember too many games that we did play together, because they seemed to go through reserve team football in one season. Uh, at that time, we were a very successful reserve side. Uh, the youngsters coming through, Charlie Nicholas, Mark Reid, Danny Craney. Uh, myself, John Half and Davey Moyes, uh, Jim Duffy was there as well. So there was a, a backbone of a good young squad there. And Paul came into that at the latter, the latter stages along with Jim McAnally as well. But he seemed to go through it a lot quicker. The things just click right away for Paul, you know. You tend to wait maybe a year or two for them to fill out physically-wise, but next day was straight in there right away. You could tell he was ready, even at such an early age. And we, we got to a situation where I was keeping him out the team simply because of his age and not, not because of his ability. And I worried about it, how to introduce him. And then I, I decided we were going to take the plunge. He made his debut against Queen of the South in the Scottish Cup. His league debut followed shortly after. I didn't tell Paul anything about it. Didn't let him know he was going to be in the team or anything because I felt that was the best way to handle it. And we got to Aberdeen, um, told them maybe an hour and a half before kickoff we were playing. He went out and played as that's the only place he'd ever been. McCluskey, McStay, oh yes, sheer brilliance from young Paul McStay. After scoring in your debut, you're going to get a wee bit of publicity, maybe even after that, a good spell, maybe two or three games, a wee run just in, and then I was uh, demoted to the bench, you know, because my forum had dipped a wee bit, but I was just delighted to get a, a crack at it uh, at, at, at such a young age. The following season, Paul played in every league match and in October played in his first old firm game. 
in a memorable match, the young protégé was outstanding. Bowen playing it through the middle, the Rangers defence headed heading, here's a great chance for Martin McLeod. McStay following up. Paul McStay in his first all for match makes it one apiece. Yeah, I think if you look at the pictures of the time or the TV footage, I think that would explain how happy I was. Uh, I just couldn't believe it. You know, even though it was a six-yard tap and the, the happiness and the joy it brought myself and uh, all the fans in the background, uh, I think uh, that memory will live us for a long time. Stay so determined. Perfect chance for McGarvey. The two exceptional qualities I seen was his vision and his passing ability. He had, he had a great ability, Paul, when he first came in the team that he was playing against stronger guys, quicker guys than himself. But because his vision was so good, he was a yard ahead of him. He could make space in any any amount of situations. And for somebody so young, that's that's difficult to do. And when you see it in somebody so young, you realise the talent is there. So it was. I think it was easy for Billy McNeil at that stage just to throw him in. There is a certain size to Paul that a lot of people don't really ever see. I mean, the, the drive he has on the, on the field has always been there. He hates to lose. He doesn't always maybe show his emotions that, that people would say, ah, oh, well, you know, he, he doesn't look as if he really cares sometimes, but he does. He takes it really personally and he really and it goes deep. He was also a great ball winner. He would drive himself into challenges and, and really, without thinking about it, really seriously into challenges. So he had many talents. McCluskey. Second chance, that's it. Let's stay. One nothing. Beautiful ball by McStay. Yes, number 29, Charlie Nicholas. At that time, I mean, Charlie was a sensational player. And uh, I mean, people would pay entrance money to watch him alone. Very talented guy. And he came through the ranks as did the. Uh, uh, Willie, Danny Craney, David Moyes, John Halpin at that time. There was a lot of good lads coming through. He had now firmly established himself in the side, playing with skill and maturity. In December 1982, Celtic faced Rangers in the League Cup final. Problem. A good position for Celtic, and that's a goal! First medal. Probably the thing that annoys me most is I got taken off in the game. I got a bad injury and uh, didn't see the game out. But uh, the goals again stick out. Oh, the two great goals, you know, Charlie and Murdo. And again, savouring the, another piece of silverware again, not just after winning the league a few months earlier and then winning the league cup. No, it was just uh, amazing times. And uh, again, I wanted it to go on forever. But uh, as we found out, after that, no, it didn't. The old firm stranglehold was broken with the emergence of Dundee United and Aberdeen. Celtic, however, had discovered a special talent. Stay brilliant goal. The, the most outstanding thing is, is, is his poise. He's got marvellous uh, poise. And as soon as he gets control of the ball, you see he knows exactly where the ball is. His head's up, he's looking to see where he's going to play it who he can introduce to the game. He's got a marvellous awareness of what's going on around the belt. Always seems to have time in the ball, which is, which is the hallmark of all great players. Uh, he's got fantastic vision, both short and long. Uh, and he's one of these players that can totally control a game. And there's, been, there's a lot of great players in the world that maybe do it for maybe a 10 or a 15 minute spell in the game. And they hope that in that time they do their damage. Paul McStay, I've always felt, was someone that can go and can control a game from the start to the finish. Cloud now to McStay. Spuns, McStay again. Absolutely magnificent. The departure of Billy McNeil as manager in 1983 after disagreement with the board 
led to the appointment of Davy Hay and a very different style of management. Very quiet, Davy, in a, in a way. If he got on his wrong side or if he wasn't happy, I'll let you know. And I felt the brunt of that a couple of times, though. A dramatic Scottish Cup victory in 1985 came after the second half substitution of Tommy Burns and Paul. The changes that day they helped us win the cup because we were going nowhere and the manager felt we made the changes. I was disappointed to come off myself, but I mean, the, the change did win the game. And uh, again, it was great because Willie was part of that team as well. And I just, it was a happy mixed day household that night, I'll tell you. Just the two has been part of a cup winning team. Away from McKinnon. There's the equaliser. The following season saw further drama and an amazing finish to the title race. You, you don't give up the fight and you, you never quit. And I, I don't think any Celtic team should. And I think that, that proves why. Because, I mean, we are sort of dead and buried around about the, the turn of the year. And we just kept on plodding away, you know, just playing some good stuff, getting results. And eventually we won the league in the the last 10 minutes of, of, of the season, really. No question about it, Celtic are certainly playing like champions. Last Deacon testing Tom Wilson. Makes his way to the byline, here's Martin McLeod, now McStay. 4-0 to Celtic. Paul McStay. Last two of need two bites. Be a goal for Dundee. Sheer bedlam around the stadium. Well, you don't need to hear any more news than that. Dundee clearly has scored at Dens. And let's lift off here at Love Street. It was just amazing scenes at, at Love Street that day. I don't think anybody could believe that we did it. No, we're always hoping that maybe something like that would happen. And probably my dad uh, was one of the few who really believed that we would do it. He was always saying to me, keep going, you're going to do it, no? because uh, hearts will slip up and you've got to be there when, when they do. So that gave me encouragement as well. It was brought up Lark Hall, it was my father and another man who started the local boys club team, really, because we'd all been knocking about on the streets and messing about that way. And he started up a local team, Medahill United, which Willie and myself get involved in, and then later Raymond. So it showed you how much he was uh, wanting us to be involved in the football scene, because yeah, it's a game that he played as well at a good level at junior, and uh, he wanted us to, because we had an interest in it too, he wanted to give us a start because there was nothing round about the area at that time and he's seen that as a, a wee gap to be filled and I thank him for that. I try to make them benefit from the mistakes that I made. Being in charge of the boys club and taking over the school team at an early age helped me be very influential in what they did. I wouldn't depend on MDLs doing it, which happens a lot with boys clubs and whatnot. People run them out for their own glory a lot of them. I'm not thinking the progress of the kids. As my dad said, I was a, a late developer. I started when I was seven, which is, uh, I suppose, quite late for a mixed day to start kicking the ball about or getting a, a real interest in it. Paul actually was very much uh, advanced for his, his age. Uh, he always played two year above himself. Um, even from early days at school, he was eight year old playing in the primary school cup final. It was a a prestigious one in uh, our local area. Uh, he was actually man of the match, playing against kids of 11 years of age. And he, he'd done that right through his career, in the area we come from as well, uh, out in Lark Hall. Uh, the McStay name was always connected with Celtic. The McStay connection goes back all the way to 1912, when Paul's granduncle Willie McStay first joined the club. He went on to become captain. That honour was also bestowed upon his brother Jimmy, who succeeded him as skipper in 1929. Well, Jimmy managed the club for a short period and the two of them actually played in the same team as well. They, they won things here and uh, there's not been that many managers of Celtic Football Club and it's great that a mixed day has been involved there. The family were steeped in Celtic and Paul soon became a keen supporter. They started at an early age and that is the thing about the club. It's, uh, 
there's so much family involvement in it, really. You know, from an early age, you're taking away the games. And I always remember uh, playing for Meadowhall one day, and actually the supporters' bus stopped at the side of the park, and I was substituted so that I could go and watch Celtic playing up in Perth. So there I was, jumping in the Lark Hogs Celtic supporters' club with my red, white and blue Meadowhall strip on, so <laughs> I got a bit of abuse for that. Paul also had the benefit of learning his trade from a footballing legend. In my early days at Holy Cross, there was a, a competition uh, to, to, to go and train with and meet the, the great Pele. I think the day he walked in, I'm just in awe, you know, you'd only seen this guy on TV. He's like a, a bit of a god, really, you know, to any young footballer at the time. And I, I presented him with a, a Celtic jersey, which I still got the pictures of. The talented youngster became the only player to have played for Scotland in all three underage teams and was described by national youth coach Andy Roxburgh as the most exciting young player he had ever seen. Every Scottish team that was picked at one stage, Paul seemed to be involved in it, you know, youth level, under 16, everything. And I worried that, that maybe he was getting overplayed at uh, too early an age. The, the first time I saw him playing, I knew that this was an extraordinary talent. I remember going down to Wembley to see him playing in that magnificent schoolboys international and in great company. Um, he really looked, still looked a, a, a real piece of polish and a real piece of class. Held it high once more towards Coyne, the big number five would come up. And Scotland now with McStay, a shot and a goal! 1-1! One, one. The Scottish captain has equalised Paul McStay making his record 16th appearance for Scotland today and celebrates with an equalising goal. Here's Dick. Aim going past his man nicely. A lovely little bit of style there by Dick. Played back there. Oh, and a chance in McStay has made it 2 2. The famous 5 4 victory at Wembley. Amazing the re response I got from back up the road. Like all the lads were inundated with you no know, press and things, you no know, wanting to know about in the game because I think it made such a, a big impact at the time. Winning at Wembley was a special moment. There were 72,000 that day. English kids. I think we went down with three bus loads. And actually, his mother and I went down and the coach from Holy Cross School, full of kids and what they were going to do. We were going to beat England and out sing them, out shout them. They got the fright of life in the land in there and seen hundreds of English buses going in. But uh, the performance of the boys was just magnificent, an all-round performance. And Paul scored two great goals. John McStay is justifiably proud of Paul's achievements, as indeed he is of all three of his sons. None more so than in 1984, when Willie and Paul both scored in a 3-0 defeat of Rangers. For Paul and his wife, Anne-Marie, the warmth of a close-knit and supportive family is invaluable and provides a means of relaxation, even if the talk invariably turns to football. His brother Raymond, who was also in Celtic's books for a time, knows the importance of his family to Paul. He's quiet when he's around people he doesn't know, but when he's in the family atmosphere and maybe a couple of beers, he, then you see the real Paul each day. You know, because anybody that knows him, like the way the family knows him, are close friends, and now he's not quiet. People are very comfortable with him. Oh, well, it's not, oh, that's Paul McStay. It's, oh, it's just one of the family. He's not treated any, any different, and he would never want that way anyway. And I think that sense, his close friends, his close friends and his family, is where he relaxes. He doesn't go seeking attention. Uh, he just relaxes with his, his wife and family. In 1986, Scottish football was rocked by the arrival of Graham Souness as Rangers player-manager. With him came expensive signings from south of the border, and in his first season, the league championship was won by a rejuvenated Rangers side. Celtic supporters knew it was vital that they mount a challenge in their hundredth year in existence. It's a, a very special year. There was plenty of celebrations uh, arranged off the park. You know, the, there was a play to commemorate the the, the centenary and lots of other things you know, that supporters were running. So it was important that uh, we had some, some, some success on the park as well.
Billy McNeil returned to the helm and set about the task of restructuring a side which had lost some key players. It was interesting because obviously all I had seen were, were, were fleeting games of him and you know, I wondered how his development had gone, but I needn't have worried because he had progressed satisfied. He'd become the good experienced player. He was the top man, and everybody else took uh, a lot of heart from the way he went about his job and his game. Uh, and I think he, he dr drove us on to, to win that championship that year. It worked marvellously well for, for that particular year, just something I think you know, in Celtic's history that it had to be done at that time. And it all fell all gel together perfectly. Gary Mackay will get in a very good position here. Oh, went beyond everybody in turn. was just flowing football. I mean, with that many options, a, a good strong squad, and uh, there's so much pace in the flanks as well. So really, the thing that I'm looking for is outs and with the, the width and the pace there. There's, there's plenty of uh, choices where to hit the ball, really. In an outstanding season, 23-year-old McStay was voted both Players and Writers Player of the Year and played in every league game. You know, individual games, I could pick out loads and loads in which Paul was showing, but the, the lovely thing about him is there's a consistency about his performances that is very heartening. Um, what people maybe don't appreciate is it really works hard in games. It's not just a case of games coming to him. He sets out to put himself right in the, in the, 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 the engine room, and he invariably is, is in there. And when things are going for him, then he's really tremendous to have on your side. Good play from Paul McStay. Two men waiting in the box. There's Big Stay looping it across to Rogan on the far side. It's back to Billy Stark. Appeals for handball against Goff, but still not clear for Rangers. There's Paul McStay. Paul McStay with the open goal. 21 minutes into the second half. The Celtic end goes wild. A superb strike by Paul McStay. The one you could say that they clinched the title that game because we knew if, if Rangers would have won it, no, they'd have clawed them back into a wee bit and we'd have been under pressure not till the end of the season. But winning there, I think, uh, sort of eased, eased the pressure. And again, a, a great team performance. Uh, everybody knew what had to be done in the day and just went about our business. And there was no way we were, we were going to let it slip that day. I don't know what the official record for the crowd was. There must have been about 80,000 in there. You know, they were on the track and everything, and the scenes were quite incredible. If you could have written the script, that's the way you wanted it to be. You know, probably Brother Ball for the way back then, probably say, if you want to win the league, it's going to be the centenary here. You know? The fans showed their appreciation as well. The scenes were just amazing. Throughout that year, Celtic had provided a series of fighting performances, coming from behind to secure crucial victories. 
The Scottish Cup final of that season was heart-stopping, even by Celtic standards. Gallagher! It's a magnificent goal for Dundee United! If things weren't going well, there was that spirit and belief, self-belief, that we could still go and win a game with five minutes to go. Good play by Rogan. But the old spirit came through again, the determination, and I suppose we were saying, well, it's our year, you're going to, you're going to take this one as well. They're stuck! <laughs> McAvenny! Frank McAvenny has won the cup for Celtic! You know the happiness that you feel inside, but I think when you look in the terraces and you just see the the smiling faces and jumping for joy, I think that affects you even more. Because it's just because just it means so much to them now. What was a special year for Paul, his wedding to Anne-Marie McGarity was further cause for celebration. And the Greenock girl became his wife during the close season. Most people who know Paul know that his commitment to his wife and daughters is a large part of his life. The glamour of the footballing world is something which Anne-Marie is unimpressed by. I was on the phone and just chatting away, and she was asking what I did. I was just trying to explain, I know, well, I play football. And she says, well, no, what's your real job? There's a new bump in the motor, <laughs> Don't talk to me about yeah. bumps. <laughs> Here we are a few years later with two wee kiddies and one in the way. If you take away all the time that the football takes up, I think the time that's left has to be spent with your family, really. And Marie's been brilliant. She's uh, a big part of my life now. I think the kids, the kids give you a form of escapism, I suppose. I think that's what helps helps distract them, maybe, um, and helps them to get over things. Uh, you always put things in perspective. I think uh, it's realistic that way. He knows that uh, there's more to life when he's finished football, but just now it's, it's awful hard for him to take uh, when they lose. I used to go to all the home games with Paul's mum. Uh, before I had the kids, but now it's curtailed a wee bit. So he'll never blow his own trumpet, never. He's very modest and he'll never come home and say that he's, uh, he's been outstanding or um, had a good game or anything. He's just always um, first to criticise himself. The family are very special and they've always been just like an extension of my own family. And You know, it's just been... It's been great from that point of view. We all got on well and they would be right behind us if we needed them. <laughs> In every footballer's career, the spectre of serious injury can loom large. While before 1991, Paul remained relatively injury-free, he was out of action for virtually the first time in 10 years when he picked up a knee injury in a pre-season friendly. At that time, it was frustrating because it's the first time I'd really had anything like this, so that's a really long-term injury. If I do have an injury, I know there's somebody very capable of looking after this. No, Brian Scott, I think he's priceless now. If you put him in the transfer market, he'd be worth millions, and that's no exaggeration. Yeah, he's just priceless for a place like this. We've had the medial ligament, which was detached here, which was surgically stapled back on. Last season, he had three operations on, on and around his foot and ankle and his left, uh, left side as well. Uh, on top of that, for the left hernia repair. So, I mean, it's all down the one side, you know, it's the left hernia, left medial ligament. These are three wee bony deposits that were found in amongst the tendons here. Uh, the surgeon 
just chipped this wee bit of bone off the front here. It actually just fell off. It was dead easy to do. But um, if we could get a new new left leg, if you we'd be doing okay on it, you know. Yeah. One of Brian Scott's other innovations was that of the hyperbaric chamber, which, with a combination of increased pressure and oxygen, helps to reduce any swelling caused by injury. I think we've had the machine for about two years now. Sometimes I know it's about an hour you're in. Hey, I think if you're a bad boy, you sent off of that, you go in here for a wee while, kill you down. Very, very, very professional in his whole attitude. You know, whether it's in here with his injured, um, whether he's in the gym, you know, he gives it 100%. You can guarantee he won't take shortcuts. But the thing is about him is he's training. He works very, very hard every single day in his training. You know, and I think anybody who came in as a young boy, you'd probably need to look at Paul McStay and say, that's what you want to achieve. And he's still doing that and he's 31. And he's still working as hard as anybody. And he still wants to be a success. And nobody hurts more than Paul McStay than the Celtic could beat. McStay picks it up for Celtic. Paul McStay! Despite a good start to season 89-90, there was to be disappointment for Celtic in the title race. After the previous year's highs, they were wanting to go in and win the championship again. That didn't materialise, but we managed to get a bit of silverware anyway, and it's crucial for a place less to keep on winning things. I think after the success of the double winning year, you try and build on that. It should have been a springboard for going on and getting a good run of like winning championships uh, and trophies, but there was no investment at that time in uh, quality players. Instead of that, we're letting players go. We had lost influential players. We had lost players um, with, with, with tremendous enthusiasm and infectious enthusiasm. Um, so Paul was thrust into a difficult position, plus the fact that things weren't going particularly well. We had Obviously, the challenge from Rangers, they, they seem to have almost a, an inexhaustible supply of funds to, to, to buy good and quality players. We lost too many experienced players. I mean, everybody went, well, we had four or five players left after that, and it left me and Paul as the, the oldest stagers in the team, you know. I mean, we were, I was only 23, 24, Paul was 25. And we were left to people who look up to us coming into the side, and it was very, very difficult, because we were still looking for a lot of help. Among those who left were Burns and Aiken. The older established players were, were getting let go then, and that takes a lot of the soul away. And I, I don't think it helped people like Paul. Suddenly, I think he was, what, 24, 25, and caught in the middle of a, a club who was a little bit of turmoil, and he was having to carry a responsibility. Very unfair. He wasn't getting much help at all. Paul became the third McStay to captain Celtic, taking over from Roy Aiken in 1990. He also succeeded Aiken as skipper of Scotland. He now has over 70 caps for his country. My first full international was against Uruguay. Again, it came at a very early age, and it was uh, the great Mr. Steen who gave me my chance. And uh, to be involved with a team that Mr. Steen managed was just unbelievable. At that time, Scotland had quite a few stars. I mean, they had Sunas, who was at his peak at Liverpool at that time. David Cooper was, was automatic on the left. He was playing well for Rangers. Jim Bett, you, you had many talented players, Gordon Stratton also. So it wasn't particularly easy for the youngster to come in and always get his place. But he established himself really quickly into the team. And within, I think, three or four caps, he had more or less made, made the place his own. A great cross. The head out of the ball is into that. And it's Paul McStay. The youngest Scotsman on the field gets his first goal for Scotland. Mr Steen was saying, no, it's a chance for me to sort of make my mark at the international level. I'd been in the team for a couple of years and, no, maybe he was looking for a wee bit more. Team they won by McLeish. McLeish with a layoff to Paul McStay. And a great goal from McStay! Sheer genius from the Celtic midfield player. And Scotland go two in front. Well, we weren't tired of watching this. We took the layoff from Dalton, advanced a few steps, and look at the power in the shot. 
Well, until tonight, he'd never scored for Scotland. But now, in his eighth international, he's made it two. And I can tell you that that goal from which they brought Chuck Steen off his seat to be on the bench, right onto the track. Paul relished the opportunity to play with one of his boyhood heroes. My idol was uh, the king, Mr. Dalglish. I think he is unbelievable. You know, just so much talent. And to play alongside him, you know, I think that's when you truly see how good a player he is. Paul went to Mexico with Alec Ferguson and the Scotland squad in 1986 and played in the last game against Uruguay, enjoying the opportunity to amass valuable experience. What can he do? Oh, brilliant goal! Oh dear, that is super. It caps one of the finest midfield performances by a Scot I've seen in years. Despite a disappointing World Cup in Italy, Paul remained a committed and enthusiastic performer for his country and made a significant contribution to Scottish efforts to qualify for the 1992 European Championships in Sweden. McAllister to McStay, there's McCoy, he's onside, he turns it on again with the opening goal, there's Paul McStay, this should be the up there. Scotland have made the breakthrough. The smile on the face of Paul McStay heralds his seventh international goal. On the 14th of October 1990, he surpassed Danny McGrain's parkhead record of 62 caps to become the most capped Celtic player ever. The transformation that has taken place at Celtic in recent times is something that gives Paul a great deal of pleasure. The process of rebuilding the club is evident in the magnificent new stadium that continues to take shape. The turmoil that engulfed the club in the early 90s was evident for all to see. Against this background, Paul was forced to consider the option of seeking new challenges further afield. Press speculation abounded about his future as his contract came up for renewal in the close season of 1992. Really, I just wanted to, to see what my options were. I think I said that, that many times when I was asked. I just want to see what my options are. I want my contract to, to run out. Supporters were stunned when Paul made a much talked about gesture at the end of the last game of the season. I, I threw my chairs into the crowd uh, just to say thanks for all those years of support. And if I was going, though, no, I'd said my, my, my farewells because I heard players in the past saying I never had a chance to say bye bye to the fans or just to say th thanks to them. I never really thought about it at the time, that there would be such an impact, but I just wanted to show the fans my appreciation. There was a huge amount of speculation about his future as he agonised over the decision he had to make. There was a, an opportunity for him at one time where he could have left the club, and I've no doubt, I mean, I spoke to him before about that uh, many times and told him that you know, if he wanted to improve himself as an individual, it would possibly be better for him to go to the continent or to England or wherever and learn something else, as opposed to you know, just the, the same thing week in, week out, the same players marking you, making it difficult for you to play, and not really bothering about whether they're playing or not, just as long as you're not playing. And it takes a lot to, to keep battling against that type of thing. Although the media the pressure to like, make a decision at that time was unreal, no, I think they were want me to make a decision right away whether to stay or go and lots of letters from fans you know, giving us backing and uh, saying no, we're, we're right behind you, just you take your time, never mind listen to the media. I think it was a big decision to make but I was 100% behind him, definitely. I um, would have gone anywhere with him if he had to move and he felt um, for any reason they wanted to move then yeah, definitely I've been 100% behind him. My wife Anne-Marie had always stated after all the, the year of uh, will he go or will he stay sort of thing, she always says, make sure you have no regrets. Never have any regrets when you finish your career. If you wanted to go and play elsewhere and all the rest of it, because I don't want you moaning later on in life that, yeah, you want to do this, I want to do that. It's actually amazing the amount of people who are want, want to sign him at that time. And I think that was testament to the spell he was going through and the form he was showing his career and he handled it very, very well. After an outstanding performance in the European Championships, Paul was ready to make his decision. One of the major factors 
right through my career has been my family. And now with my new family starting in November, uh, maybe it's in Anne Marie's and myself's interest that the baby is born in Scotland. Having considered the alternatives, he has never regretted his decision to stand by the club he loves. And people just give an opinion. You know, they don't look at a whole general picture, they just give an opinion of what they think would be best for, for Paul. But ultimately, Paul McSay was the, the one that had to make up his own mind. And nobody can ever say he was right or wrong or whatever. he done what he felt was best for him and for his family. And that is everybody's uh, prerogative. The downward spiral, which had begun after 1988, had continued into the 90s. Throughout this barren spell, which would last six years, McStay remained an inspirational figure for Celtic. Billy McNeil departed to be replaced by former Irish international Liam Brady, but the problems at the club ran deep and success remained elusive. Liam had great ideas, I think, at that time, even if you asked fans, that he had us playing a lot of good football. The only thing it was lacking was a, a bit of punch, you know, a bit of that killer thing. There were so many things wrong. I mean, we'd still support us turning up week in, week out, which was frightening, but still so many things wrong behind the scenes. We've shared a room now for about pff, 10 years, 12 years, we've been in the first team together. And I know how much he was hurting and how much he was sat and spoke about it a few times. About Sometimes you don't like speaking about it because you try and forget about it at times. And I knew how much he was hurting because they said, well, both of us had the same feelings for the club. And we knew there were certain guys coming in, there was people coming in not with the feeling of the club that we had because it was probably brought through his family, the same way it was brought through my family, what Celtic meant to each other, you know. And that was getting lost and Paul couldn't handle that, I couldn't handle that. And we found it very, very difficult. So I think Paul's got to take great credit the way he held his head up being captain of Celtic Football Club at a very, very, very difficult time. Boyd, McStay. The patience of supporters was running out and the Celtic board remained intransigent in the face of protests about their lack of investment and refusal to relinquish control. It was an impossible situation for Paul, who was unable to make his true feelings known. It's, it's particularly difficult when you're captain of the club. I mean, it's not the worry that you're saying the wrong thing or you're disagreeing with people. That ain't the worry of it. I understood Paul's predicament there. It's just the fact that he's a club captain. He's got to be shown the right example to younger players and other players. And, and the supporters trying to keep a unity together in the, in the club. At that time, I felt the unity was completely gone anyway between board and players and supporters too. I think only the players and the supporters had any sign of a relationship which was, which was getting a bit uh, hard to accept for the players at times. But Paul kept trying to keep it together as best he could. I really realised the predicament he was in and understood his position. The appointment of Lou McCarry as manager failed to paper over the cracks. There wasn't a lot you could say. It was your employers and uh, you, you, did have, you did have to watch what was said. The only way you could try to help with the situation again is go out in the park and give your all, and that's something I did. You don't want to deflect all the blame at that time on the park. It wasn't happening. and We, as players, myself included, have got to, I've got to look at myself and say, what did I do at that time? Uh, was it enough to come in and try and work in an atmosphere which was getting worse every day? Was, uh, Pretty hard. Back with Paul McStay. And Celtic have made it at last. The captain strikes. At the 11th hour, the club was saved by Fergus McCann, who came in with the cash injection that was needed. Paul's relief was shared by the supporters, as was his delight at the appointment of Tommy Burns as manager. I just felt that Tommy would end up back here in some capacity. I'm sure he always dreamed to come back here as manager. And maybe it happened quicker than what he thought. He's still a young man and he's a couple of years at Kilmarnock. It's good experience, but to come in, try and like, turn this club around as well, he had a, a big job in his hands. And for the midfield players, for the hat and Grant in particular, you're looking up, you see the first front player, up the side him, up the side him. So it comes to the object, the him, then he's in and the ball's getting laid off. And I'll get the second to go. Just to see that. Brad checks inside McCall. 
on for McStay. It's a second for Celtic. And the Miller superb goal. Paul and the team received an immediate boost and celebrated with a superb performance against Rangers at the start of the new season. However, the ills of the club were far from cured. The Coca-Cola Cup of 1994 is a nightmare that is etched on the memory of every Celtic fan. I think it wasn't even just about that day. I think it was about the years before it. This could wipe away all that, the bad memories sort of thing, bring the happiness back. And uh, It just wasn't like a one-off cup final. It was, it was like six years rolled into one after the feeling of feeling you should have won the game and then having this intense pressure. With the score tied at 2-2 after extra time, it came to the agonising ordeal of a penalty shootout. The responsibility fell to the captain as it went to sudden death. The keeper saved it. The keeper saved my penalty and I just felt like the whole world came in really. It was just unbelievable. But they fight back the tears, I just felt just said I'm not just control yourself now. But later that night I just couldn't handle it anymore now. It just just cracked, that was a word. I remember running from my seat down through it, through the, the front door of Ibrox out to be with to be with him, to comfort him. Because uh, he must have felt the whole world had collapsed on him at that particular time. But he never went moaning about it. Uh, he took it as part of the responsibility of what he was uh, there to do. He was a captain of Celtic. He'd put his life into football, and that was one of the downs. I didn't even feel sorry for myself. I felt sorry for the Celtic fans who turned up that day. I fully hope of winning this trophy. I just felt so hurt for them, so gutted. It wasn't even self sympathy. It's just that I'd missed this penalty that could have turned things and it was just hard to handle now. But again, you see how do you get back from it? You can either run away, go in a shell or go out and face it. The next morning the press were here. I had to go out and face them and uh, I suppose that was part of the therapy. Well, we dealt with it very well and with great dignity. Very difficult for him to, to come through that because I know he'd wanted it so much to, to, to win that cup and losing it and in the manner in which we lost it. I mean, a penalty thing is nothing. I mean, he's brave enough to go and take it. And it's one of these things that, that was just meant to be. But uh, obviously seeing how upset and distressed he was after the game and back at Celtic Park and just the, the feelings that every Celtic supporter went through, which was just, you know, mental torture because we all felt the same way and thinking, God, are we ever going to get out of this mess? The only way that I know how to answer is on the park. And uh, I knew there were still things to play for. The fans' reaction, the, the following game, helped tremendously. And I think the, the reaction at Easter Road, the, the, the band, you'll never walk alone, Paul. I just felt I'd let all these guys down, though, and I didn't know what to expect that night. And uh, that showed me what they thought of me and uh, that they would be there for us now. Paul had a lump in his throat that night for the response he got, and that tells you what the punters thought of him. And that tells you immediately, Paul will get it out of your system. The Scottish Cup campaign provided Paul with the opportunity to make amends. From such a low with the Coca-Cola Cup final to such a high with the Scottish Cup, in six months as well. And that only came through hard work from the team. We'd uh, experienced the disappointment, uh, and we, we just wanted a bit of silverware, and we knew what was needed. We needed a good cup run, and. Yeah, we gave that. We gave a lot of a lot of fighting performances and the semi-finals as well on really good displays. Thank you with the next day. Great ball in the foot back. That's the under. Brilliant play from Celtic. Good play from next day. This is McLaughlin. Collins way right in the left. The final wasn't a classic, but the main thing was just winning that cup. After playing well in the Coca-Cola Cup and losing it, uh, we just wanted to win this one. We needed it so badly. What people don't realise is unbearable pressure that we were all under that day. 
and none more so than, than, than Paul himself because I know what he must have felt that day and I was looking at him during the game and praying for him during the game that we just get this because I knew that once he'd won that trophy he would have the belief again and so it proved. Lachlan sends over a good cross, that's awkward. Jimmy Boyle scambles the ball away but only as far as McKinley. That's for Van Hoydonk. Great header! And Celtic are ahead! I think the relief was, uh, was there for all to see and the happiness was there for all to see as well. There was nobody any happier to see him going up these stairs himself. Just so thrilled for him and I think he's facing the final whistle and that whole day and night was just a picture and I just so happy for him you know, and for every Celtic support. And the relief when we did the lap of honour and all the putters faces, I mean it was just incredible. That it was a tension and relief rather than the feeling of success again. And I think that was the same with Paul that day. It was just, you know, he, he was exhausted when he got back in the changing room just because uh, He'd finally done it, that's it, he'd achieved what he'd always wanted to achieve as captain. Had that feeling, and the, the pressure had gone. The rebuilding of Celtic continued in the wake of the Scottish Cup victory and season 95-96 has seen a rejuvenated Paul McStay. Kinley doing well to get in the cross. Once again, it's David Farrell who's here. Shoot up by Grant. It's Paul McStay! That's a wonderful goal by the Celtic captain! Say some things to be trying get him back and said things to him that possibly I shouldn't have said to him but were done for the right reasons to try and upset him and to get him angry because I always felt when he was angry he's better, a better player and it worked, it worked and thank God it worked because, uh, because it was a long time we're wondering you know, if he'd lost him or if he'd so many years in the doldrums he was never going to get out of it again to say some nasty things to him, cheap things just to have a shot just to see what kind of reaction we'd get from him whether he would take the bait or no and he took it Although he was my old teammate, my old, old pal, he, he let me know as well that I better start performing uh, to levels that he knew I could, could do week in, week out. He didn't want it for a couple of weeks and then fall away. Last year he let me know it a couple of times. He dropped us and uh, that was hard to take. But we uh, got a, a couple of wee wrestles over it. But we managed to sort things out and uh, that's what happens in football. And lo and behold, he come back in, he's worked away, his attitude's been great and uh, I feel like he's been born again this year, definitely, because what, what I see now is everything I ever wanted for him. And uh, if I had to say some things that upset him and he's maybe kept it in his mind, they were only said to, to get the best of him. Paul McStay has over 70 caps for Scotland and has played more than 600 games for Celtic. He remains an inspirational figure for the club and one of Scottish football's most talented players. 37,300 fans braved the elements on a cold December night to pay tribute to one of their favourite sons. And they weren't disappointed as they were treated to a highly competitive game against English champions Manchester United. Early in the game, Simon Donnelly broke from inside his own half and embarked upon a 60-yard run, finding Andy Walker with his layoff. Walker's ball across the goal mouth caught the United defence square, and it fell to Pierre van Hoydonk to open the scoring with the easiest of chances.
A United corner in the 19th minute gave the visitors an opportunity to level the score. Steve Bruce nudging the loose ball to Paul Scholes, who finished well, beating young Stuart Kerr in the Celtic goal. That was a way it stayed until the second half when a measured ball from Tosh McKinley found Van Hoijonk 30 yards from goal. Despite claims for a handball, a superb strike from the Dutchman put Celtic ahead. They are showing the kind of finishing that has made him top scorer this season. Celtic continued to press with substitute Chris Hay coming off best in this encounter. A delicate chip over the keeper made it 3-1 with five minutes to go. A memorable goal for the young Celt. For Paul McStay, it was an emotional occasion to mark an outstanding career with the club and fans he loves. Uh, it's all right saying you're a big Celtic man, I've the start and other. I've got the chance to prove it even more by going out there and doing it for the team that I supported. I'd like to think my commitment on the park maybe tells people how much this place means to me. And I'm sure once I hang up my boots, the scarf will get brought back out again and going to watch the games. So, I mean, that's the only team I want to see winning anyway. From the early days when my mum used to wash the strips and used to sit and hanging out the back door and I mean, that shows you how much my mum was committed. Went to all the games as well, still does. If it wasn't for them, I don't think we'd be where we are now. They encouraged us so much to go and get what we wanted, whether it had been something else, but it happened to be football and they seen that. So they encouraged us and gave us, gave us every backing. Made sacrifices when we needed a new pair of boots as well. All these things uh, will live with me forever. I just, I can't thank you all enough know how much this means to me. I've came here many a year on the terrace watching the famous Celts testimonial nights. I've played food and it's just an unbelievable feeling. And I thank you all for making this very special night for myself and my family. very much the leader now. He's had all the experiences it's possible. He's played in World Cups, European Championships, League Championship medals, Scottish Cup winners medals, been the captain. Always been one of the main players and he's got all that experience to call on now. And that is why now that he, he controls the game for us and he controls the tempo of the game. And it, it was so important that we got him back into that frame of mind and playing that way because he is the one that everything involves in. He's a great player. He's one of the, the best players I, I've played against. He's played at the top now for so many years both with club and country, and he's played some truly outstanding games, and I think he's, he's, it's fair to say he's one of Celtic all-time greats. When we talk about Jimmy McGrory's Jimmy Johnson, and Kenny Douglas, in the years to come, we'll be talking about Paul McStay, or the young kids will still be talking about him, I'm sure of that. <laughs> 